direction for progress. Uh, supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, this and previous papers seek to both highlight and inform state and metro policy innovation on crucial economic topics. And one preoccupation of the series for several years has been the question of how to scale up the clean energy solutions uh, uh, at a time of substantial federal policy pullback. Uh, work my group at Brookings uh, produced previously documented that federal policy and subsidy support for clean energy has declined by about 75 percent in dollar terms since the height of the 2008 Recovery Act. Um, Meanwhile, it's hardly news to any of you uh, that in attendance today that fiscal stress and political gridlock have not only greatly reduced the availability of top-down subsidies and grants from Washington in recent years, but promised to depress their availability for the foreseeable future and apply real pressure uh, to state and local budgets as well. So what we've been trying to do uh, here at Brookings with partners is to understand how states and regions can make progress on their own regardless of the situation in Washington. In this vein, we've sought in the last couple of years to identify and promote some of the most promising state and local experiments at financing clean energy, energy scale-up without direct support or grants. Uh, working from, with Lou Milford and Clean Energy Group, we noted uh, how a, a number of state clean energy funds have been experimenting with a broader industry development focus as opposed to simply funding individual projects. Similarly, we've worked with Reed Hunt and Ken Berlin at the Coalition for Green Capital to highlight how Connecticut and New York have developed green banks that leverage limited public sector funds with private capital to provide low-cost loans and clean energy projects. Uh, which brings us to our topic today, bond financing for clean energy. Uh, quite simply, we believe state and local bond finance represents a powerful but underutilized tool for future clean energy investment. For 100 years, uh, the nation's state and local infrastructure finance agencies have, without fuss, issued trillions of dollars worth of public finance bonds to fund the construction of the nation's roads, bridges, and sewers. Now, as clean energy subsidies dwindle, these agencies are increasingly willing, uh, I think we're going to hear, to finance clean energy projects if only the clean energy community embraces the idea. So there's a lot of room for progress here if two communities uh, uh, work together. Hence today's webinar. And occasion, uh, occasioned by the new Brookings paper, uh, we've gathered a great panel of experts and implementers who are going to discuss financing clean energy development through the bond market. What we're going to do is uh, first have two brief comments from two of my co-authors on the new paper to frame the opportunity. And then we thought we'd hear from two on-the-ground in innovators uh, who are working with this uh, tool in creative ways. So I think we'll both have sort of the concept and, and uh, a theoretical discussion, but also uh, uh, nitty-gritty uh, execution uh, discussion. Uh, so in that fashion, we'll hear first from Toby Rittner, uh, President and CEO of the Council of Development Finance Agencies, who will speak for the bond finance industry and talk about sentiments in that community around the, this uh, agenda. Then Lou Milford, president of Clean Energy Group and our lead uh, author on the paper, will describe the need and opportunity for using bond finance now, challenges to scaling it up, and how some states and municipalities are innovating. And after that, we'll go to ground. And Jeff Pitkin, treasurer of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, will describe a recent watershed issuance of revenue bonds by NACERTA. Uh, you know, really very creative, important work, a real watershed. And then Paul Toth, president and CEO of uh, the Toledo Lucas County Port Authority, will describe a recent creative project he's been uh, developing uh, there. After we hear from these four, uh, as uh, uh, Jason suggested, we'll open the floor to questions and comments from the audience. So begin formulating those ideas, and, and you can use the chat box to communicate with us. Um, uh, so with that, I'd like to convey this to Toby Rittner of the Council for Development Finance Agencies. All right, thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks very brief because you really want to hear from uh, everybody on the ground, from our, uh, from our primary author of this publication. Uh, first, let me just thank Brookings, uh, Mark, and your team, and uh, Clean Energy Group, Lou, and your team 
Uh, and then I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Jason Rittenberg and my staff here at CFA for helping pull uh, this uh, complexity of webinar all together with all these speakers and everything. And I know with the turnout, we're really, really excited by uh, the hundreds of people that have registered for this. So great opportunity and great partnership. And so thank you to everybody. Um, let me just briefly tell you about CDFA. If you don't know, most of you know, but we're a 32-year-old National Trade Association headquartered in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we provide education, advocacy, research, resources, and networking uh, within 12 roundtables, a national summit, uh, over 5,000 online resources for development finance, a number of newsletters, et cetera. Um, what's really important about CDFA is that Today is kind of a watershed day for us. We were born in 1982. We were born because of a tax and discussions about tax-exempt bonds and the bond market. In the 80s, Congress was going through a process of tax reform, and one of the items on the, on the list for potential reforms or eliminations were tax-exempt bonds, uh, namely private activity bonds for economic development, energy, wastewater, prisons, schools, nonprofits, manufacturers, et cetera. And our, our group formed in 1982 to combat that negativity around the use of bonds. And we wrote the 86 tax bill related to private activity bonds uh, for a number of different categories. And so for the last 30 years, we have been working in the bond world to explain to anybody that will listen and to educate anyone who's willing to learn about the importance of bond finance. Most people aren't aware, but bond finance goes back over 100 years. It was in the original tax code of the US government, tax exempt bonds. And so this is not a new tool. This is not a tool that is not understood or has a, has a diminishing value or return. This is a 100 year old market. It's a $3.3 trillion market on Wall Street. It's the second most secure market in the world uh, behind only US treasuries. The bond market has virtually uh, the lowest default rate of any market in the world, and it is a tested and, and it's a time-used uh, tool to build all the infrastructure and the amenities that we think about in a community. About two years ago, uh, maybe a little more than that now, Lou Milford and I met each other and we decided that it was important uh, after many conversations that the clean energy world and the bond world come together and to collaborate. So Lou and I did a road show and we were able to seek funding, and we got funding for an initiative called the Clean Energy Plus Bond Finance Initiative. And what's come out of that is a handful of activities that we're doing in partnership with CEG. Um, we have resources online, a website, it's cebfi.org, cebfi.org. You can get there from CEG's website or from CDFA's website, either one. Um, we've done a lot of writing, model documents of examples of how you can use bonds to do energy. We found uh, we followed pilots and projects around the country, and we're trying to encourage communities and states to keep pushing the envelope on the development finance uh, role for bonds uh, related to clean energy. Uh, we have the website. We also have a CEBFI newsletter that we encourage anyone to to sign up for. It's been an overwhelming success. We've had a couple of events, released a number of papers, and today, like I said, is sort of a watershed moment for the CEBFI efforts because. If you read through the report, you'll see in the footnotes the numerous uh, references to Clean Energy Bond Finance Initiative, uh, our group. So we're really excited because when a group like Brookings takes on uh, this issue and really gives it some validity, we know we've finally made a dent in the public policy world about how important bonds can be for infrastructure or for energy. And that brings me to my, my closing remarks, I guess, a couple things. Um, Bonds have built America. We, we frankly uh, say, uh, um, uh, you know, building America built by bonds. And we use that term a lot around here because every road, every bridge, every sewer, uh, the, the amenities you use every day are built by bonds. But what bonds haven't built are energy. And we don't understand that. And we've sort of questioned that philosophy for, for the last few years to the point where now people are listening. Energy is just another element of infrastructure. And clean energy is a sustainable, smart, uh, element of infrastructure. If we can retrofit buildings, if we can provide energy generation for states and locals through wind and water uh, and, and solar, there's all sorts of opportunity for us to use clean energy technologies and finance them just like we finance any other piece of infrastructure. 
every day around the country there are a dozen or, uh, or more big bond issuances, hundreds of millions of dollars of bond issuances for infrastructure in our communities. Why not just layer clean energy right into that capital stack uh, like any other infrastructure that we would? And we're seeing promising progress in perhaps the places we would least expect it, and I mean this in all the nicest terms. Places like South Florida, uh, Oregon, California, those, those are places that we might see that expectation. But the advancements being made in Toledo, Ohio, and New York State, these and Connecticut are, are beyond the pilot phase. These are into the real uh, nuts and bolts of building clean energy using bond financing structures. And it's really amazing sitting here at CDFA to watch places like the Lucas County Port Authority, the Green Bank, and Nysterda in, uh, in New York and Connecticut do what they're doing because they really are carrying on that legacy of using bonds for infrastructure. I would be remiss if I did not mention that there are significant threats to bonds right now. We're back in a tax reform environment. So Congress has been debating tax reform uh, for the last four years. Thankfully, they have been largely unsuccessful in this because groups like CDFA and the Bonds for America Coalition, which we sit on the executive committee, and many other groups are fighting hard to preserve tax-exempt bonds. And if you can believe this, there's actually a discussion in Congress amongst small groups to eliminate the tax exemption. And uh, we think this is preposterous. We think this is one of the most ill-advised concepts in the history of public policy. And we have been very vocal about it. Congressman Camp put out a tax reform package a few months ago that was largely uh, largely uh, viewed as being uh, completely ridiculous. But in that, he eliminated private activity bonds. So half of the bonds in the country are private activity bonds for nonprofits and, and manufacturers and schools and whatnot. He would have eliminated those. They would have also capped the deduction on, on bonds, uh, the tax exemption for bonds. And so these ideas are bad ideas, and it's sort of an ill-informed policy. What we want to make sure is that you're going to leave this web webinar all excited about clean energy and bonds, but keep in mind in the back of your head that bonds are, are under attack again, and they remain that way, um, and we're working hard to keep them uh, on our table, part of our toolbox. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Brookings and Clean Energy Group and my team, Jason Logan, here for putting this together, and I'll hand it over to uh, Lou Milford. Lou, you got it? That's it. Got it. Thanks very much, uh, Toby, and, and uh, again, thanks to Mark, his team at Brookings. Really good, uh, excellent group, and uh, Toby and his folks at um, CDFA uh, with the project we've had for the last year. Um, it's my task to try to summarize the paper a bit. What I want to do is talk about two things. Um, why did we write it? Um, and then, two, what it says. Um, in terms of why, uh, we've, we're facing significant critical issues uh, on climate, clean energy, uh, impacts of climate-related um, severe weather, need for more resilient power systems. But the thread that cuts across all of those problems, as Mark noted, is scale. Um, we now have small penetration of uh, much of the clean energy technologies that we're familiar with, but we need to get those to mainstream. We're, we're nowhere near the penetration we need for wind or solar, offshore wind, even more challenging problems like uh, carbon capture for storage of greenhouse gas emissions or <clears throat> new forms of solar with storage that could work um, during power outages um, that we've seen in uh, situations like Sandy and, um, and, and other uh, severe weather events. So the missing part of the discussion often around the scale debate is financing. Uh, we talk a great deal about policy and mandates and grants and subsidies, but not enough about financing. Um, and there are two parts of that. Uh, one is how do we get these technologies cheaper? And we often can do that by reducing the financing costs associated with um, current ways that we finance technologies, often tax equity, which is good but can be expensive. And secondly, how do we finance enough of the technologies to make a major difference in the big problems like climate and clean energy and resilient power, how do we get to scale? And the recent IPCC report, we're talking about Earth Day today, and indicates that hundreds of billions of dollars are needed um, to address the big problems we're facing, and we're not going to get there with existing financing tools. So we need a massive increase in financing in the next decade or two. So we think one answer is bond financing, infrastructure financing. It's sort of boring, traditional, often ignored, um, but uh, why does it do 
what existing tools perhaps don't do. One has been mentioned, we're talking about a financing tool that has raised trillions of dollars. They operate at the scale we need to address these problems. Um, they're somewhat easy to understand to some extent, um, and in, they're in use by every level of government. Um, they don't really require new forms of legislation, although some tweaks would make them easier to use for clean energy. Um, they can be adapted for uh, clean energy, for climate, for resilient power. Um, they're good for efficiency. They're also good for big generation projects, or they can be. Um, and also, importantly, investors seem to want these new forms of fixed income investments in this space. Um, if we look to see a lot of the activity at the international level around what have been termed green bonds. Um, they could also be the basis for new state and federal cooperation, a really a nonpartisan way um, to try to uh, drive financing in this space. So the real barrier is really hard work, hard work, enough needed, more needed, and political will. And it's been said, we're going to hear today about some progress that's been made. Um, and so the question is really how to expand it. And that's what the paper is largely about. And if you've read it or maybe will read it, it really addresses four areas. Um, and I'll just touch on those very briefly in the time, in the next minute or two that I have. Um, the areas are partnerships, projects, information, and investors. Um, in terms of partnerships, what we're recommending is a much more intensive collaboration between clean energy policymakers in states and bonding officials. These are the two worlds that often haven't gotten together, and they need to get together. Um, and there are many things they can do together in terms of identifying opportunities, barriers to public and private investment, um, analyzing these instruments to see how they might fit specific needs, energy needs at the state level, um, and then developing networks to try to accelerate and move uh, this activity. Uh, again, much of this is happening. Uh, we also think organizations like these green banks that have begun uh, popping up around the states also have in many cases, bonding authority, and they should be considering the use of that, much like has happened in the UK Green Bank uh, in, in Europe to, um, to, to finance large-scale projects, perhaps even like things like offshore wind. Uh, secondly, we need to do more projects. Um, and what, again, the good news is that in, in virtually every project that's done to raise, that has raised capital, public and private, has used different forms of credit enhancement. Uh, we've written about that previously and cite that in the paper. Um, and we think that um, there are many examples that can be advanced. Uh, you're going to hear about some of them today. But we think states should be considering things like joint investment plans, um, dedicating a certain amount of bond capital to clean energy projects over a certain number of years, looking at, uh, at uh, instruments like pooled bonds for clean energy, um, uh, committing to using uh, state public financing tools, like uh, you'll hear today from Jeff, uh, as was done in New York. That could be done any place in the country um, to link the energy funds and the water funds um, to finance clean energy uh, technologies. And also perhaps looking at using some existing system benefit charge funds for securitization of those uh, charges to then create larger pools of capital as uh, is being looked at in places like Hawaii. Third, from projects, we need a lot more standardization and uh, documentation of um, of these projects, data from these projects, so that we can create, you know, a standardized investment um, uh, uh, product um, that can be um, uh, used in the market more freely. Uh, so we have a more liquid use of of these uh, tools going forward. And we've suggested a number of things that can be done um, to try to get to that point. Uh, there have been models such as NREL is doing something similar in the solar field. Um, a lot more work needs to be done in the space, and the federal labs could play a role as well. Finally, um, we, need to, we need to get investors more engaged in this process. Um, we think that uh, there is the demand from institutional investors for fixed income clean energy securities. Um, it's showing up at the international market. It's showing up in some uh, places in the domestic market. Um, but we think there needs to be you know, a good deal of, of testing uh, of uh, what the specific needs are from the institutional investors so that we can begin to create uh, an asset class around uh, clean energy bonds. So that, that's a quick highlight summary of what the paper does. Um, you know, we're looking for partners uh, to help us uh, try to achieve a lot of these uh, goals, and uh, we think we're on, on the right track, um, but there's obviously a lot more work that uh, needs to be done. So that's, I think, enough for me, and let's hear from the 
real people who were uh, doing this work on the ground. So I'll turn it over to Jeff. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Lou. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's Jeff Pitkin, the treasurer of NYSERDA. In the fall of 2012, we approached one of the national bond rating agencies seeking a rating on a bond issue supported by a pledge of loan repayments from residential energy efficiency loans that we issued in a program uh, launched in late 2010. This program created a revolving loan fund designed to fund and aggregate loans, which could then be financed through a secondary markets bond financing. The loan portfolio included third-party originated unsecured consumer loans and also on-bill on recovery loans where borrowers repay their obligations through a charge on their utility bill. Now we received feedback and determined uh, that getting to a satisfactory bond rating was a challenge based upon the agency's traditional structured finance ratings methodology, principally due to the lack of sufficient payment performance history of our portfolio. We tried to supplement our limited performance history with performance history from another state program and also from summary level history we were able to obtain from a federal loan portfolio but this information wasn't sufficient to meet the agency's requirements. We found that even providing significant levels of funded reserves was unlikely to allow the bonds to get to a higher rating. And yet we felt that completing a publicly rated, publicly issued structure with at least a single A rating was important to reach broad institutional investor distribution and also to further the potential for accessing secondary markets capital in scale. Fortunately, we've been having discussions with one of our governmental partners, the New York, Envi New York State Environmental Facilities Corporation, about the potential for collaborating on financing, uh, recognizing our closely aligned missions. Uh, EFC manages the largest state revolving fund program in the country, which provides financing assistance to local governments and others for clean water and drinking water projects. It has about $6.1 billion of outstanding AAA rated bonds. We jointly approached the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency seeking concurrence that the federal SRF programs should be able to provide financial assistance to our portfolio's energy efficiency loans due to the nexus between the environmental benefits produced and the improvements to the state water bodies meeting the SRF program requirements. And EPA concurred with that in March of 2013. So in August of 2013, we closed on a $24.3 million bond issuance. The bonds were structured with a pledge of loan repayments from over 3,200 loan, residential energy efficiency loans with an aggregate principal balance of about $29.2 million. The bonds were structured with a guarantee from EFC, allowing them to achieve a, chip, a AAA rating from S&P and Moody's based upon EFC's underlying rating. Now, this was the first time the SRF program had been used in this manner. It allowed us to leverage the maturity and the credit of the SRF program to help support work in clean energy while this sector builds performance history, allowing it to, to, to achieve satisfactory credit ratings for its new asset class. To protect the SRF program, we pledged to our guarantor $8.5 million in a reserve account funded with federal grant funds received from the U.S. Department of Energy, which will be reduced pro rata over the term of the bonds. The bonds also included qualified energy conservation bond interest subsidies from the U.S. Treasury, allowing the bonds, which carried an average term of about 6.8 years, to be priced at a weighted average interest rate of about 3.2% and a net interest cost of about half a percent. We think the transaction was a huge success. Uh, orders received from investors were over 1.7 times available allotments, and about 34% of the bonds were sold to non-traditional municipal bond investors with social responsibility mandates. The deal went on to be named the 2013 Small Issuer Deal of the Year by the bond buyer, and we believe that the transaction represents a replicable model for other states to follow, and NYSERDA and EFC are happy to provide information and assistance to others interested in following up. And now I'll turn it over to Paul. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so I'm going to give you a 30-second background of the Toledo-Lucas County Port Authority and what our role is in Northwest Ohio community. We were, we were created in 1955 as the first Port Authority in the state of Ohio, uh, and back in those days gave us very broad powers, including uh, 
eminent domain, uh, ability to issue bonds, uh, own property, and uh, lots of powers for economic development purposes. We started out as an organization that began running, running shipping operations with the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway allowing international vessels into the Great Lakes. And we then took on the operation of two airports, took, purchased and redeveloped a train station, uh, and more recently have been involved in redeveloping uh, old industrial sites in the community. In 1988, we took on a role of economic development in the community and developed and managed several programs related to community development, including managing the SBA 504 loan program for the region, managing the state of Ohio's regional 166 loan program for the region. We helped launch a uh, community-wide microloan program in 2012. We've set up a, a CDE and have applied for new market tax credits for the community. We also created in 1988 the Northwest Ohio Bond Fund, uh, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Uh, we've recently launched an EB-5 international investment program for the region. And uh, most recently in 2010, we developed the Better Buildings of Northwest Ohio Energy Program. So uh, as Jeff just mentioned, the challenge with uh, issuing bonds, of course, is getting a rating and uh, um, getting the rating agencies to, to take your uh, program seriously. We created our Northwest Ohio Bond Fund in 1988. Uh, it is a uh, bond fund that has received a triple B plus positive outlook bond rating from Standard & Poor's. Uh, we've completed about $250 million worth of projects within that fund currently have a balance of about $70 million and have a uh, pool of reserves that are equal to about 50% of that outstanding balance or roughly $35 million. In many instances, we, use, we have used this bond program in the community to leverage other state, local, and private funds to develop a capital stack for a given project. In 2010, as we were uh, starting to uh, uh, slowly eke our way out of the recession. Uh, we didn't see much activity in our bond fund uh, program. There wasn't many many companies uh, borrowing money at the time. So we began to look around and look for opportunities uh, and we found that really in uh, leveraging our, our Northwest Ohio bond fund for alternative energy and energy efficiency financing and, and uh, developed uh, through, through with a grant from the Department of Energy, the Better Buildings of Northwest Ohio program. Uh, the program really provides all aspects of energy efficiency and alternative energy financing and program management. We do everything from energy assessments to verification of energy savings. We've got uh, a small team, but they manage uh, rebates through local utilities. Uh, best practices, and uh, we partnered initially with the city of Toledo, and have completed uh, energy efficiency improvements on about 60 of their buildings. Um, so we typically leverage our Northwest Ohio bond fund to provide long-term fixed rate financing for energy efficiency and alternative energy projects that range in uh, typical terms are from 10 to 15 years. Normally we fund smaller projects through a revolving loan fund. Then we group the smaller projects into five to six million dollar bond issues, which is then uh, repaid through energy, energy special assessments on property, or in essence, as everybody knows, these are PACE bonds. Uh, in the event of a default payment of taxes, the special assessment becomes a lien on the property. Uh, in most instances, we issue several series of bonds within a single issue to allow for staggered terms. Some of our borrowers are looking for 10-year terms. Some of them are looking for 15-year terms. Others are looking for shorter terms. We typically keep those in our revolving loan fund. We've also leveraged qualified energy conservation bonds through the program, uh, as which, as Jeff mentioned, provides a uh, federal government subsidy on the uh, taxable interest rate. Um, we've also recently partnered with the state of Ohio on an ener energy efficiency reserve fund, which will allow us to even further uh, leverage our uh, bond fund and be able to do uh, more projects than we had initially anticipated. Uh, one thing that's fairly unique about our program is that uh, we have made it a point to get uh, sign-off and approval for any mortgage lender or lien holder on the property 
part of placing the special assessments. Um, that gives us comfort that uh, as we get into uh, into these projects, and if there was a default, that uh, everybody recognizes that the special assessment has been placed on the property. So I guess in summary, we've uh, since 2010, when we began the program, we've completed about $30 million worth of projects in our community, uh, including more than 100 building retrofits. We've also financed and constructed a one megawatt solar installation at the city of Toledo's water treatment plant, a three megawatt uh, solar rooftop project for GM's power plant, train plant here in Toledo, uh, and currently working on several geothermal product projects uh, here in Northwest Ohio. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Jason, I believe, and uh, go for Q&A. Perfect. Thank okay. You, Paul. Um, all the panelists now available to speak, and I'm going to actually let Mark go ahead and moderate the discussion here. Oh, perfect. And and uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Jason, and and thanks to all of the uh, all of you for uh, very nice, succinct descriptions uh, uh, of your work. Uh, let me just start first with a, a question uh, um, to especially uh, uh, Lou and, and uh, uh, Toby to start off. You know, to what extent, you know, how, how much of the scale up need in this country uh, can be attacked through the bond market? I mean, clearly uh, the bond market has great strength for some of our uh, uh, mammoth need for project development that is less relevant for other parts. I mean, uh, I wonder if maybe, Lou, you take a shot at you know, putting this into context a little bit uh, and maybe uh, Toby give a sense of you know, what you think the appetite is uh, uh, where the sweet spots may be. Uh, sure, Mark. Let me let me tr give a sh uh, give a try at that. You know, I think one way to put this in context is to think about how much money, we, public money, particularly, we actually spend on clean energy today. It's actually not very much. Um, you know, the effective um, tax equity amount from what like the PTC is about six or seven billion dollars a year. Um, when you look around and see what the states are spending. Uh, through public funds, um, maybe it's a half a billion, a billion a year, um, you know, that's married to um, some of the FRPS like, laws, mandates. So the dollar numbers are not that large. It's amazing really how much we've gotten done uh, with the small investments, public investments we've made. Um, so the, I think the attraction of, of bond finance is that, and Toby can talk more to this, is that, you know, we are talking about a you know, a, an industry that can raise hundreds of billions of dollars a year through these tools. Um, so the, the potential is there um, to get a much greater scale of public investment, which in turn leverages private investment in this space. And I think the other, uh, and so I think the scale is clearly there. We need to tap it. We're only at small levels now. Um, uh, like you know, NYSERDA and Toledo and other numbers probably add up to hundreds of millions of dollars, not billions yet, but they can get there. Um, and I think the other important thing to just underscore with this is not only the amount of dollars that could come from this type of investment, but also the notion that we can um, uh, create more long-term uh, contractual commitments going out 15 years or 20 years of uh, financing rather than short-term uh, bank lending and turnaround that adds to the uh, financing costs of projects. So it's, I think that's the other uh, part of this. So it's not only scale, but it's type of investment that could lead to uh, potentially reduced financing costs. So Toby, please jump in. Yeah, no, I mean, so the capacity, as far as we're concerned, the capacity for bonds to serve the clean energy market is, you know, to be a little facetious, is unlimited. Um, if you look at, say, <clears throat> Private activity bonds subject to volume cap, which is just too much information for everybody on this call. But you know, in the last five years, there's been about what 300 billion dollars of um, 300 billion, including uh, cap and non, -cap. including cap and non-cap private activity bonds um, issued. And then, if you look at just like small areas, I mean, half of the private activity bonds issued in this country are are non-profit bonds, which can be used to do clean energy. So 
um, that's a big component of it. And then if you look at the whole, you know, the whole capacity, the whole market, the market is $3.3 trillion. So it's a big, big space. And, you know, uh, a, a city like Columbus, Ohio will do a, a $2 billion bond issuance every couple of years for all their capital improvements, for their operate, for their projects, and no one will think twice about it. That same pot of money and resource exists for clean energy technologies and clean energy investment, whether that's generation or uh, uh, energy efficiency or renewable energies. And so as far as capacity and the scope, I think there is unlimited capacity and a great opportunity to, to use bonds in the clean energy market. Uh, thanks for that. So, and uh, we have a nice queue of uh, some questions coming in. Feel free to use your chat box uh, to pepper this uh, great panel with more questions. Uh, I'm going to uh, ask uh, one more question, uh, perhaps to the implementers. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear, you know, hear from um, Jeff and Paul. You know, what are what are the the barrier. What have what have what have been the barriers in in, in the last decade uh, to seeing this scaled up? It, you know, it, you're you're hearing that it seems like a natural marriage uh, uh, of communities, the bond finance community, and clean the clean energy community. Uh, you know, why why is this not uh, 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 reached scale to date? Uh, do you want to take a whack at that, Jeff? Yeah, I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll start it. Um, you know, I think we've seen efficient uh, markets and processes for uh, structured finance products, things like, you know, the way securitizations of mortgages and automobile loans uh, and other forms of receivables occur. Um, we think that same, you know, market uh, has the potential to uh, deal with, you know, securitizations of receivables of things like clean energy products. Um, the challenge, again, is the traditional, you know, methodology that's used um, relies upon a great deal of, of historical information that this sector just doesn't have yet. And so what we did um, is effectively uh, used a credit enhancement approach. We, we, we didn't follow a structured finance um, structuring approach, but rather used a more traditional municipal bond approach uh, with a traditional credit enhancement a guarantee. And we think that's appropriate uh, during this time frame that um, we need to uh, develop um, m more substantial amounts of performance data that then could allow uh, these structures to stand on their own and get to appropriate ratings levels on their own without credit enhancement in the future. That's great. Uh, here's a, here's a question from one of our uh, uh, audience members uh, who asked, is it realistic to seek bond financing for projects combining wind power with technologies like compressed air uh, energy storage? And I think that gets to, you know, again, what kinds of technologies and projects does lend themselves best to this? Uh, maybe, uh, what about Lou, you take a whack at that, and then maybe uh, let's hear from Paul. That's a good question, I, and I was asked this the, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, there have been some examples of use of bond finance, particularly by um, uh, municipal borrowers or municipal um, entities that are procuring uh, power from wind projects. Um, so it's possible to use uh, uh, kind of QECB or nonprofit type bonds to securitize th those uh, the power purchase agreements basically so I think it's possible to do in the wind sector I think it's a little more complicated um, you know I think one of the issues with this whole area that I didn't mention before we didn't mention before is that you know people do ask why is, is this not happened before I think it's because it's new um, and that basically we have kind of structured ways of financing these projects that largely are tax equity driven. We've been in that uh, market for the last 20 years or so and I hope and, and think that will continue. So I think much of this is thinking through different financial structures that can take advantage of these new tools. Um, so I think it's perfectly possible but we're not there yet. Paul, do you have a, any quick comment on that? Um, no, I think uh you know, I, 
we've we've looked at it. the the bottom line is is that you got to have solid economics of the project in order to take the risk. You know, so either you get the bond, either you take it through a rated uh, um, program like we've got in our bond fund, or you get it out there and and uh, sell it unrated, but uh, the, the market's going to determine the level of risk. I think anything's possible if you've got a solid power purchase agreement with a solid, reputable company behind it, uh, good quality uh, technology that's proven with a warranty. I mean, those are all the things that we weigh when we look at funding uh, a solar project, a wind project. Uh, we've looked at several combinations. And uh, typically what happens is, is that one leg of the stool always seems to fall down to uh, to create uh, doubt within the within the um, uh, you know the, the strength of the the financial backing on projects. Yeah. Uh, how uh, another uh, another member of the audience asked about uh, this group's thoughts about REITs. Uh, how do these compare to bond financing for energy P threes? Uh, Toby, do you do you have a observation about that? not my area of expertise, but uh, maybe, maybe Lou does. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you know, the, one of the issues with REITs is, you know, that there is a need for clarification or uh, guidance from Treasury to be able to use them for, um, you know, for clean energy, whether it's uh, particularly solar and other kinds of technology. So it, it, I'm not an expert on this, but I think there, all, there you know, are some uh, guidelines and other issues that need to be clarified for that, which you know again raises the kind of a comparative question that what we're, what we're trying to do with the bonds area is to try to avoid as much as possible you know the need for new legislation, new clarification, new treasury rulings um, where um, uh, you know we're we're saying it's possible to simply to try to adapt uh, these existing tools to projects uh, without legislative or other you know, regulatory changes. So, I mean, that's not an answer on the comparative economics, but it's it's a it's an attempt at an answer to say why we're looking at this space as as um, you know, in contrast to some other approaches. Yeah, um, I'm wondering. Um, yeah, uh, there's a couple questions along the line of, you know. Do we have it? Uh, do, do does anyone care to mention any other interesting models that they've seen, either uh, uh, along the New York model or uh, others uh, at in other municipality uh, experiments? I could just touch on one, perhaps, Mark. And one we touched on in the paper is what's been uh, termed the Morris model, uh, yeah. which is a solar a bond financing of solar approach that um, ha has started in, in New York in New Jersey um, and that's basically a, a kind of an aggregated uh, municipal approach uh, where a county authority um, issued a bond these are revenue bonds were issued to support installation of solar uh, on multiple public facilities and these were done under a lease arrangement with a developer um, and the essentially the utility payments back uh, to the developer were used to um, essentially support the uh, uh, bond payments and, and we think that that is a uh, completely replicable model um, that could be expanded throughout the country um, there's a lawyer uh, by the name of Steve Perlman in New Jersey who you know, uh, be created that model with a number of his clients um, we've referenced it there's a lot of good material that's been written about it uh, by NREL by us and by others and uh, if municipalities uh, or county authorities, you know, are looking for some other models for financing um, installations on public facilities like solar. Or I would mention also, um, what we're, we're calling resilient power. You know, we're in a sort of a post-Sandy world where um, many communities and states are looking to um, uh, provide more distributed generation that can withstand power outages in severe weather. We think that 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 potentially bonding, public finance uh, of those kinds of installations, whether it's solar storage, CHP, um, other kinds of distributed generation is really critical. It serves a public need, and our sense is that you know, public finance tools could be a perfect marriage uh, to expand use of the, those technologies in critical public facilities. Yeah, yep. this, this is Toby. I mean, there's two 
really good examples that, um, I mean, one is, is Connecticut, what they're doing in Connecticut. I mean, one element of the Connecticut success story is that they are a bond issuer, and they are not a bond issuer because they brought the Connecticut Development Authority or Development Finance Authority, their traditional bond authority, into the fold. And so one of their pillars of their strategy is using their bonding capacity to be able to do what they're doing in Connecticut, which is, you know, to me, just kind of fundamental in the explanation of the whole bond world. The second example is, is one that's probably on nobody's radar screen, but is a perfect example of, of scalability. In California, the iBank did a small industrial development bond for a manufacturer a few years ago where they did, I believe it's rooftop solar, and in that example, they did an IDB, a tax-exempt IDB for uh, renewable energy facilities on top of a manufacturing facility, low-cost financing for the manufacturer, again, using public finance mechanism, using a bond mechanism, and you talk about scalability and replicability, IDBs can be done in every state around the country through thousands of issuers. And that's something that every community could go out tomorrow and manufacture on. So there's lots of other small scale examples like that around the country. That's a great point. Here, somewhat uh, related, here's another uh, good question from the audience um, about lar uh, large renewable energy projects. So, uh, it's observed that these often have a, a longer time frame uh, for payback due to additional capital costs. Um, I'm wondering, Jeff, uh, what's the longest time frame you've seen uh, on these, and uh, how does some of that play out? Well, I won't. I won't speak so much to the financing of large scale of, of renewable projects, but but <clears throat> the tenor is is certainly an issue, and in our program. Um, we were really kind of pushing the envelope in allowing um, effectively unsecured consumer financing going out to a 15-year term. And we felt that that was necessary because we were trying to support a program of comprehensive, comprehensive energy efficiency. And so oftentimes, um, you know, the paybacks require, require uh, kind of more patience uh, for the tenor. Uh, certainly, we're seeing structures of you know, solar lease structures and others that are pushing uh, clean energy investments out to a 20-year term. So, um, and I think as Toby remarked earlier, I think the um, the time frames of the clean energy sector um, match nicely with the instruments that are available um, using traditional uh, bond financing techniques. Thank you for that, uh, Jeff. We have several questions uh, about how uh, QECBs remain slow and how and why uh, that those can be improved. Uh, uh, Jeff, do you want to pick up on that and maybe then we could hear from uh, uh, Lou? Yeah, I do. I mean, Congress authorized about $3.2 billion uh, nationally of Qualified Energy Conservation Bonds Bonding Authority, and I think the last number that I've seen is something on the order of only about $700 million has been uh, issued to date. Uh, it's, it's probably a different number than that. Um, in part, I think the challenges there are that the way in which the allocations were um, were suballocated, uh, each state was required to suballocate amounts down to local governments that had a population in excess of 100,000, and so oftentimes this resulted in in very very small amounts being allocated to large local governments, um, and which may have made those impractical to proceed with on a standalone basis as a single issuance. So. Um, you know, opportunities of looking at how those could be more aggregated at a statewide level or creating incentives to encourage those local governments who have not yet used their authority to reallocate it to other local governments or the state government who could use that authority is something that uh, we're interested in pursuing. Great comment. Uh, Lou, did you have any further? And then I'll, I'll ask a couple federal questions. No, I think Jeff identified. I mean, I think it basically is, you know, a structural problem, and and um, and so it's there's sort of difficult political solutions to that problem. Um, in some states, I believe, whether it's California or others, they've essentially mandated kind of an uptake of allocations to the states. In other places, I think Jeff and, and New York and others are looking to, you know, kind of accommodations to make that happen. I think that's a really fruitful area to pursue. Um, uh, perhaps there are ways to accommodate. Uh, you know, collaborative efforts to use the QECBs within the allocations that can provide, you know, local projects that are useful, but with some state participation. Um, you know, it's a real, it's a real structural problem that everybody's trying to do a workaround. 
Um, but uh, but I think uh, there's some solutions that are possible, but a lot of work needs to be done. Well, let's uh, staying in our uh, federalist frame of mind here uh, and with federal uh, relations. You know, several people uh, are curious what can be done at the federal level to assist states. Uh, you know, it, it could be that you know a critical role of the federal government is much more catalytic uh, going forward than you know. Uh, uh, directly involved in uh, direct grants. So I wonder what a few of our panelists, uh, you know, would like to see at the federal level that that, that is both realistic but meaningful. Uh, uh, you want to pick up on that, Lou, and then I'd like to see what sure. that Sure, and Toby will probably have something to say on this, too. We, okay. with C, uh, CDFA, developed a, um, a proposal called the um, State Clean Energy Finance Initiative, SCEFI, and we have it on the website. And what it basically does is it, it's a it's a proposal for a federal credit enhancement program that's modeled after the state small business credit initiative, where states, in a federalist approach, could you basically use allocated money uh, to create credit enhancement and other tools to advance clean energy in their states. Um, and we think it's uh, you know it's a it, it worked it has worked in SSBCI could work in this area so it's something Congress could do if Congress doesn't act uh, we also think maybe it's possible for the administration to consider repurposing uh, perhaps some existing federal programs to provide something similar so we're not in a situation where the federal government is deciding individual project. Uh, credit enhancements, but actually the states are, so that um, maybe there will be more significant buy-in in that approach. But Toby, you, may, you have a lot more to know about, uh, to say yeah, about it. Yeah, no, I mean, thanks, Lou. I mean, uh, the State Clean Energy Finance in Initiative, which we all call CEFI around here, is, is the first thing that Lou and, and CG and CFA developed. And that one is really crazy, because if we could just get the federal government, I think we were asking, I think we said it could be $5 billion. $5 billion would leverage, you know, we, we, we predicted somewhere around $55 billion in clean energy finance because the CEFI model is a credit enhancer where you're, you're credit enhancing or you're helping enhance the ability to issue bonds at the local level, um, which would be a great thing. Now, that's a, that's a far-reaching idea. Some of the things are, um, here's a real good example, and, and we have this written up as well if anyone wants to ever learn about it. There's a category of tax-exempt bonds called exempt facility bonds. And these allow you to do about 17 or 18 different things, docks, wharves, mass community facilities. Um, but the one thing that it leaves out is energy. And so we've proposed two new categories for clean energy and renewable energies where it will be explicit that tax-exempt bonds can be used for clean energy or renewable energy facilities. If you did that simple two-sentence change in the tax code, which we've already written, and would be happy to share with anyone, you would be opening up the, the traditional private activity bond tax code to all those projects. Um, I can't tell you enough how big of a, of a change that would be. And it's all subject to volume cap, so it's capped at what it would cost the federal government. It's already budgeted for in the annual budget. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'd say is just to really quickly mention this about QECBs. Great idea, but it's exactly what Jeff and Lou said. It's the great idea with some ill-conceived uh, rollout. Bond issuance uh, is a federally uh, uh, created uh, authority given to states and given to locals. And so when you start to allocate those allocations all down to very small local places, they don't all have the capacity to do this. So um, there really needs to be better structure. I'll also say about QECBs, a fix that could come from the federal government is just to simplify them. They're too complex. The bond markets work simple, and when you throw in complexities about creating partnerships and, partnerships and green community initiatives and all this stuff, that gets very complex. They just want to issue the bonds. And so the, the best thing the government can do for us, the federals, is to buy these programs when they bring them down the pipeline uh, for state and local government to use. So that's, that's all I have. Great. Uh, Paul, did you want to? Did you have a comment here? And if not, I have another question for you. No, I do. Just just to follow up on the QECB issue, we we ended up. Uh, uh, it was kind of a struggle to get a five million dollar allocation through the state agency that was uh, responsible for doling these QECBs out. And as as Toby said, um, frankly, it's only public agencies or or tax exempt entities, really governmental entities, or or um, educational institutions that can really comfortably use QECBs. So unless you can find a project for a university 
uh, a municipality, a county government, or somebody like that, they're very difficult to uh, implement. I think it's a great idea with great intentions, but much more difficult in reality to put into effect. Excellent. Uh, this, this is uh, uh, embroiders on a couple related questions. Uh, 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 I'm going to ask uh, uh, maybe uh, Toby and Lou to comment on the question about first, you know, what, what are the most obvious classes uh, of projects uh, for this? And then uh, uh, another uh, audience member asked about gray areas uh, between infrastructure and other classes uh, that could be appropriate and wonders about microgrids or uh, uh, PHEV uh, fleets and so on. Uh, Lou, did you want to take a crack at that? Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, obviously efficiency projects um, along the lines of the good work that um, both Toledo and, and New York are doing, you know, rolling out, uh, uh, rolling over existing loan portfolios, a, a key area. Um, I think solar is obvious. I mean, the Morris model and others, uh, particularly for public facilities, nonprofits, I mean, this is kind of a no-brainer. You're stretching out the, uh, the payment period. Uh, reducing the costs. There are easy ways, not easy, but there are ways to do it. Pretty well proven, uh, can be done. I think the third area, and I mentioned this, is sort of the critical public facilities. I mean, all throughout the country, and communities, states, and cities are trying to figure out how to protect uh, critical public facilities from power outages. Uh, when the grid goes down, the grid, when the grid goes down, solar doesn't work unless it's combined with a, with a storage facility, a battery, or the like. Um, those are obvious targets. These are critical public needs. Uh, we can use public financing to get there. So those are three simple ways, and Toby probably has more. No, Lou, actually, I was going to echo the same thing. I mean, the, the, the low-hanging fruits are, are government, public-owned. I mean, you could be doing airports. You could be doing schools. We could be doing county uh, parking garages and, and city parking garages, city buildings. We could be doing those in our sleep. We could be doing thousands of those all over the country every day if we can just get communities to understand that that, like the Morris model, that's just infrastructure investment. So to me, that's the lowest hanging fruit. And then exactly EERE, like what Paul's doing in Toledo, what they're trying to do down in Cincinnati, that's the second low hanging fruit because you can do commercial EERE, residential EERE, um, and so, yeah, absolutely, I go with exactly what you went with. And then I would throw a third one in there. I think manufacturers and hospitals are the next big one. Nonprofits um, are a big, big one that could be done all over the country because we can issue 501c3 bonds to do nonprofits. So you're talking about how many hospitals, hundreds of thousands of hospitals. Those are the low-hanging. Well, this is excellent. Uh, I think with that, uh, it's... Uh, we're running out of time, and, uh, and we want to make sure that we allow people to uh, jump off uh, as they want to. Uh, so I want to thank all of you for participating. Uh, and if you have any questions for any of us, please email me at mmuro at brookingsedu, and I'll make sure uh, your note gets through to any of the other speakers that you'd like. And uh, feel free to follow me and us on Twitter, and uh, send us your email also if you'd like to uh, receive periodic updates. Uh, the paper is available uh, on the website, uh, Brookings Metro, and there's lots of other information related to these topics at the Clean Energy Group site and the Council of Development Finance Agencies. I think with that, I'm going to uh, hand this uh, to Jason to wrap up. Great. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think you stole most of my thunder on the outro, though, just to reiterate, um, people who want additional resources, the contact information is up on your screen. We will be sending a follow-up that will have a link to the paper and to a few additional resources as well, so you can be sure to keep a lookout for that. I know we received more questions than we had an opportunity to get to today. We really appreciate everybody's enthusiasm on this topic and look forward to speaking with you in other contexts soon. So thank you all, and have a great day. Thanks, folks. See ya. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.